Hey, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Craig Stromberg. I am the uh, regional vice president for our state and local government team. Um, I want to thank you all for coming to the uh, uh, Pacific Northwest user group meeting. We've got a great agenda today. Uh, um, we'll do a, a quick round of introductions, kind of review the agenda and a couple of housekeeping items, and then we'll get right into the presentations. So Gina, if you'll advance the slide for me. Uh, just uh, quick introductions. Um, again, uh, my name is Craig Stromberg. I'm actually based in Denver. I'm the only one that probably has uh, some snow and maybe blue sky. I think there was some blue sky in some of the some of the presenters' backgrounds today. Um, but nice uh, crisp day here in Denver. Um, with us on the on the call today, from a Tableau perspective, is Gina. Some of you may have talked to Gina. She's uh, the inside sales rep who covers uh, this territory for us. Kelly Flanders. I think probably a lot of people know Kelly from our, our renewals team. Uh, Amanda Westland, uh, one of our lead solution engineers. Kevin McKinney is also on. He's not on this slide, but Kevin is on as well. And Del Singh, again, another, um, another individual that's been around a long time supporting this region. So all of our email addresses are on here. Um, some of you uh, probably aware that, uh, that uh, Jason Caffrey, who was our um, our sales representative who covered this area for a, uh, for a while, left the company uh, recently. We're actually in the process of, of backfilling his position and hopefully uh, you know, we, can, we can share that information soon. But in the interim, um, I, you know, I wanna thank everybody that's on this slide for helping keeping things going and, and uh, hopefully being responsive to questions that have come in. We'll continue to do that and, and be available for anything that comes up. So thank you for your patience. And, um, and hopefully we have uh, some news on, uh, on that very soon. Um, a couple of housekeeping items uh, before we kind of go through the agenda. Uh, we are gonna record the session. So you can see that in your screen. So we will be able to post this later. You see something you wanna um, come back to down the road, feel free. Um, uh, Zoom has um, a couple different features. There's a chat feature and a Q&A feature. So if you use the chat feature, um, just be sure to, um, see who your chat is going to. You can send it to individuals, the panelists, but you know we like to encourage some collaboration and, and uh, the community. So feel free to post that to, to all attendees uh, on that as well. And then the Q&A, um, the Q&A will actually follow with the recording. So um, we'd like to capture uh, Q&A as best we can. So that's another place to, to submit questions to the team. Um, Gina and myself, Dell, we'll all be kind of watching both of those forums and uh, try to prompt the presenters and, and make sure we get, uh, we get questions out to everybody. Okay, um, I think let's go through the agenda and we'll, and we'll go ahead and get started. So like I said, we've got, we've got a couple of great presentations for everybody today. This, I will say, this is one of the, um, um, the highest attended uh, uh, user group meetings in the Western region. So again, we appreciate your participation and a lot of it, um, you know, a lot of that goes to the, the content and the people that come and, and present. So that's a big part of, I think, the, uh, the good attendance. So Dan's gonna lead off um, uh, from the city of Seattle. Christy and Lily from CARE Oregon uh, have got another 20 minutes on the, on the agenda. Kevin and Amanda will finish up um, uh, kind of close out the agenda with some uh, some updates on what's new with Tableau. And then Dell will help wrap things up. We'll make sure we've tied off on all the open Q&A questions that have come up and uh, and make that last few minutes available for, for uh, any housekeeping that we need to uh, tie off on. So we've, we've tested uh, videos and slides and audio and uh, so far so good. What we're like three minutes in, no glitches quite yet. So Feeling good about this, um, Dan. No pressure, no pressure. But I, I, uh, uh, I see your videos up. So with that, I will let you. Um, I'll let you take the microphone and uh, and kick us off here. So thank you again for uh, for joining everyone. Dan Lewis, over to you. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Dan Lewis. Here with with the City of Seattle. And just quick uh, video check. Uh, you can see the presentation. Okay. We've got you. Not yet. Not coming to yeah, you. And that's why we do all the testing. 
looking positive. It always comes together. There it is. There it is. There it um, is. I'm actually a big fan of when things go wrong in meetings. Um, specifically, uh, if you're trying to use a file or something, it goes wrong because then you actually get to show how you can actually access uh, how cloud actually works uh, and saves you when the, the local file is no longer available. Um, all that said, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Dan Lewis with the city of Seattle. Um, I am part of uh, a team in Seattle IT uh, that works with a lot of data uh, at, the, at the city um, and providing government services uh, to the different departments uh, that make up the city of Seattle uh, that are servicing the residents um, of the city. Hey, Dan, so sorry yes, before you continue, we're yeah. seeing um, presenter mode. So if you want to go up and hit your display settings and just switch that just yes. so we're seeing. Oh, got it. You're on the other screen. Well, y'all don't want that one because that's just giving you everything, huh? Perfect. There you go. Is it is it giving you uh, just the one screen or is it giving you both? One, one full full presentation now. Yeah. One full good. presentation is good. I won't even tell you what I'm seeing on my side. Okay. Um, so keep me honest if I'm not talking about what I'm what's supposed to be on the screen. Um, so a lot of people ask, well, you know, one of the first things that comes up about data in the city of Seattle is, well, how does government use data? Um, and I think a big context of that was, is just taking a step back and, and looking at, well, what is government to begin with? Um, how is it structured? What is its purpose? Um, and for me, the city of Seattle, it is all about the end of the day, the residents, other municipalities and federal agencies. Um, those are typically the customers of the city of Seattle. Um, the mayor's office and administration, obviously, their um, intent is to govern um, the various departments throughout the city from uh, arts to safety to fire to human resources, you name it. Um, Seattle Public Utilities, Seattle City Light, um, all their government services one way or another um, are supported by Seattle IT. Um, Seattle IT providing a lot of the, um, the technology services, including data, um, to help them meet their, their government mandates. So now we have an idea of exactly what the city of Seattle is and how Seattle IT comes in that. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the data services um, that we're providing today at the city. Um, and in context, um, I, I will share that, you know, we're like every other organization um, in the world. We're continually looking to improve. Um, just from a support and, and strategy perspective, I have seen observed, um, Seattle IT has seen observed over the last two, two, three years, a growing interest in government on data. And not just the data, but how do we actually use that data? How do we actually leverage that data for effective decision making? Um, and so there's been a lot of work um, at the city over the last couple of years in putting in uh, the appropriate infrastructure that was going to be needed uh, to meet this need of the city as these um, evolving needs were, were coming uh, to, this, to Seattle IT. In 2020, uh, we saw a significant increase um, in the use of data at the city, um, which is wonderful news to Seattle IT. Um, today, we have various departments across the city leveraging data. Um, just to give an idea of our, of our environment with Tableau at the city, um, we have various departments from Seattle IT ourselves. Um, we're leveraging um, Tableau dashboards to improve um, our operational metrics. Um, although sometimes I don't like to see those reports because then they show me <laughs> which areas that um, we're actually not performing well, but those are truly the areas that we need to dive into. Um, even if my name is at the top of those reports sometimes. Um, but leveraging data for improving operational metrics, um, any department that is working uh, directly with the public, um, like a Seattle Fire Department, Seattle Police Department, um, they're definitely leveraging data. Um, some of our bigger users of data, um, and I'll actually highlight um, a couple of dashboards um, that have been leveraged um, this past year and, and helping the city respond to the COVID-19 uh, disruption that we've had. Um, but just to give an idea of the environment today, we have um, over 2,000 users um, that are active. Uh, we have over um, essentially about 15,000 total users 
uh, active though, I would say 2000. We have about 19 sites, 372 projects, and over 573 data sources that are being leveraged today in the environment. A lot has been done to prepare for what was, before I go on to the, that next, a lot was, was done last year um, to tee us up for 2021. Um, from data modernization efforts, user groups, um, champion groups, you name it. And so there's gonna be a lot of efforts um, that started last year. They're gonna be picking up a lot of effort this year, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, before I do that, I wanted to bring in also to this conversation, a colleague of mine, Amr. Um, Amr, do you wanna do a quick introduction of yourself, please? Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, so my name is Amr, um, I'm the, uh, a Tableau uh, applications admin for the city of Seattle uh, within Seattle IT. And uh, I support all these uh, different departments and initiatives uh, uh, reporting up uh, through, through, through Dan to our, our, our uh, CTO. And, um, and as Amro is, is aware, we have um, within last year's, the city's uh, response to COVID-19 was occurring uh, it became very quickly appear, it became very quickly um, acknowledged that data was going to be key. Uh, data was going to be so key to how the city was responding to COVID-19 um, and not just our responding, but then how we were going to recover, how the city is going to be reopening, um, leveraging data for effective dis um, decision making. So just to give you an idea of a sample um, of, of some dashboards that have been leveraged um, just over last year. This is an example from the fire department I wanted to show. Uh, so this is actually something that the fire department actively uses on a daily basis for COVID-19 tracking. Um, they have different things of, of their response that they track. Uh, so essentially when they come in, they have, they can look at um, just the, the, the dispatch EMS responses. They can drive into the data. They can look at when, um, uh, what type of medical conditions that were um, correlated because of COVID-19, um, PPE was involved, all those good things. And then particularly um, from the tracking, um, the, the big piece that made this beneficial for an insight perspective was really looking at the daily moving average. Um, that really kind of gave the, the insight into uh, where resources were needed. And I'll just show one more. And of course we love, I personally love, uh, I'm a big visual person and uh, data for me, wow, well, I can see it visually. <laughs> um, so even there were some other ways that they were actually looking at just from a four week view, um, being able to uh, geographically see um, where the responses uh, were actually taking place. Um, there were some other dashboards, which I, I wasn't able to get approval um, by this morning to display. Uh, but just to give you an example, there are some others that are being used. Uh, for one was just tracking of, um, you know, people that have been exposed to COVID-19. Um, because, you know, in these systems you have, you know, resources that are responding um, out in the city to COVID-19. Well, at the same time, you have to take care of your people. Um, and for safety perspectives, um, they were just tracking, uh, still tracking, um, just the COVID-19 exposure and, um, you know, how many people were, were actually available uh, to be working who weren't um, impacted by COVID-19 at the moment, personally. Um, Amber, do you have any more thoughts you would like to share on um, other things you've seen from the city of Seattle um, over the last year, uh, particularly around dashboards and not just COVID-19, uh, but anything you've seen in regards to dashboards and what people are looking to for, for data today? Yeah, absolutely. So one thing that was uh, really inspiring for this dashboard is uh, um, when COVID hit, uh, fire needed some assistance in, in, um, in doing some of the displays and some of the data scientists uh, from across the city, uh, from different departments actually helped out with this dashboard, you know, including Department of Early Learning, um, SDOT. Um, so, Having uh, this this one platform that they were all versant in and could just dive in and, and help build um, was truly inspiring. And so the, the mayor's office really 
um, appreciated that, that, that collaboration and that initiative. Um, and we're also leveraging our data catalog. Um, we're, we're scaling up our server for high availability. So um, a, a lot of good things have been happening with our platform um, because of uh, the success of the growth. Um, and we have had a lot of success in 2020 um, to the point that it's, it's given a lot of um, focus and prioritization to data moving into to this year. Um, and so um, just to kind of share kind of uh, with, the, with the user group here, what, what is the city looking at for, for data and how is Tableau going to be helping um, in that area? Uh, First and foremost, race and social justice. Um, City of Seattle leads um, with everything with the race and social justice lens. Uh, so just one example, uh, we're working right now with Seattle Department of Human Resources. Um, there are some dashboards that already exist today uh, in Tableau uh, around data. There's becoming a specific initiative to start leveraging that data, however, to look for the patterns of um, systemic racism. So we can actually look for ways, leverage data in actually um, addressing, um, reducing racism, uh, not just in the region, but the city of Seattle. Um, client strategy roadmap. Uh, this is another um, big area we're gonna be looking at. Uh, we're developing out uh, a two-year strategic rolling roadmap uh, between Seattle IT and our departments. Uh, as piece of that, is really making sure that the customer's needs are being met by the capabilities Seattle IT provides today. And so essentially, if they're looking to use data, well, Seattle IT is here to help you leverage that data uh, with our wonderful partners such as Tableau. Data workshops with Tableau. Uh, we're gonna have lots of workshops throughout the year, um, some internal, some will actually be having some workshops with our different departments. Um, and we actually have uh, several organizations uh, in the city that we partner with, um, whether Seattle Promise students or, uh, excuse me, Seattle Promise or was, was it Black Girls Code? Uh, so we're looking at different workshops specifically with some of our programs in the community um, and working with the, the future leaders of the city of Seattle and our future technologists, they're going to be coming um, into an age of, of joining the world of innovation and, and digital transformations. So we're looking at doing that as well. And then also just internally, lots and lots of learning. Um, digital workplace champions. Uh, in 2020, the digital workplace champions group uh, grew to over um, a thousand end users. So we essentially have 10% of the city's workforce now uh, collaborating as a user group on the different tools that are used in everyday work. Uh, there's gonna be a big initiative in 2021 to start making um, the usage and leveraging data that's available today, um, moving our, our data service model to more of a self-service uh, versus um, you know, a few people running around um, creating dashboards. We're looking for more people to be leveraging data and creating dashboards. Citywide data governance. Um, this started last year and it's something that'll be picking up speed this year. Uh, and then of course, some other things that um, the Amherst spoke to, um, our data modernization efforts are continuing. Uh, we're looking at data cataloging. Uh, we're leveraging um, visualization and data and, and digital quotient, raising the digital dexterity of employees, uh, but then also measuring their digital dexterity. Obviously in all things COVID-19 response. Um, and then also just, I, I threw this in just because they're, they're picking up very quickly um, as the year is picking up speed. Um, the city of Seattle has an innovation advisory council, uh, which is essentially a, a partnership between government and, and private sector. Um, Tableau's a, um, a partner in that. And so they'll be looking, uh, we're having several different initiatives that we'll be looking um, at data um, and how it can be used at you know some of the city's um, core things that it's, it's dealing with right now uh, you know our global uh, disruptions that we're experiencing you know from uh, the vaccination program to the um, to the city's um, crisis with those experiencing homelessness uh, you know looking at ways of, of leveraging real-time data for for driving um, I mean, no pun intended but driving um, not just effective decision making but 
creating the methods to drive people to where beds are available. Um, so as you can see, data is a hot topic at the city of Seattle. Uh, we have a lot of different things going on um, to promote data, to promote the usage of data, um, and truly really just to, to leverage data to start to fill in the gaps of where that um, knowledge may be existing or the answers may be missing um, that someone may be needing. Last but not least, uh, Seattle IT does leverage uh, objective key results uh, to align with our, our customers and what they're wanting. Um, a couple of uh, core goals for us last year carrying over are just to remain connective and collaborative, efficient and flexible, modern and innovative. And so we are actually looking at uh, what other folks have done with Tableau. Um, so whether it's a reference dashboard um, within HR, um, you know, building that data culture of, of defining the one true source of data. Um, we're looking at what Washington has done in regards to managing their techno technology infrastructure. Um, so even just internally, there's tons of things we're looking as well. And now I will stop because I know I can ramble. Um, and wanted to leave room just for some Q&A, because uh, I know that's where um, a lot of the, the real value of these, these user group sessions, um, in my, for me anyway, uh, the big value of user groups are really what we share with each other. Uh, so that's a little bit about the city of Seattle and Seattle IT, how we're leveraging data. Um, Amory, unless you have anything else to add, I think we can open up for a little Q&A. Nope. You covered it, Dan. Thank you. So it looks Thanks. like we have um, one question um, in the uh, from John Haney, and he wants to know um, if the city of Seattle audit, if does the city of Seattle audit shop utilize Tableau? If yes, do you all know? Well, we might be able to connect him with a contact person at audits uh, for Tableau usage. And what was the question? I'm sorry. He wants to know: Do you all um, use Tableau within your auditing, I guess. Amory, you have to answer that one for me. I don't believe so. No, no, not, not that, not that I'm aware of. Um, I can, we can follow up on that. At, um, okay, sure. Um, and then we have another question, and they have their name is anonymous, but um, it says Dan uh, referenced measuring digital dexterity in the user base. What does that look like in practice? That is literally a whole nother day conversation, but um, <laughs> and, and, and the reason I say that is it's something that's still evolving. Um, and but just to give you a preview, we have probably 10 different learning platforms that we leverage. Um, and I think everyone in technology knows that you go to different training sources. So when we're looking at measuring digital dexterity and are people taking training, are they increasing their skills? The only way we can actually measure that is pulling in the results and data from those different platforms into one place to actually measure our talent development program. Awesome. So our next question is from Jason Levison, and he asked, how large is your Tableau team um, that is creating and managing all of the city data? And he says, thank you for your presentation. Absolutely. Oh, um, Amory, you have to help me on this. Uh, I would say the entire team that's managing data, I won't say just Tableau, uh, because we, we like to, uh, we're big believers in sharing resources and implying uh, moving resources when we need them to where they need to be. Um, that said, um, just data engineering alone, um, there's probably at least 75 people managing data. Sam, you have to correct me if I'm, my numbers on that. Yeah, I mean, we've got a couple of uh, admins and then the, the, the ETL and our data warehouse team is about uh, 20. And then there's also a, a variety of people that are doing self-service publishing from different departments. So uh, it's and, a little hard. Yeah. And also in, in case, and I'm just time check, uh, I think we're gonna run out in two minutes. Uh, one thing I, I will share is that I'm a, big believer in partnerships and I'm a big believer in sharing um, and I'm a big believer in there's no point in reinventing the wheel when it's already been built. Um, so if, if there are any organizations out there that want to have, you know, just thought leadership discussions, um, you know, just brainstorming sessions on what's working, what's not working from end user adoption, modernization, um, you know, all those wonderful things that 
that we think about um, as technology professionals when it comes to data, we're more than happy to engage with you um, and share best practices um, and also learn from you. Um, Cause I am a big believer in that. It doesn't matter how smart you are. You literally cannot do everything or know everything. Um, and so we're always open to partnerships and, and exploring um, ways that we can help each other. Okay. Um, and then we have one more question, um, but this might be one more for the Tableau team. Um, Michelle Ziedman is asking, does Seattle Department of Transportation use Tableau? If yes, can you provide a contact? She's at Washington State Ferries. Yes, I will actually connect you. Um, they actually have several people um, in um, SDOT that are, that are working with data. Um, I'll actually connect you with those. Um, so if you just want to shoot me an email, I'll put my email in the, in the chat window. But if you shoot me an email, I'll connect you uh, to who those individuals are. Um, and for the data geeks out there, I'll be honest, they're, they're one of my favorite departments because they have so much cool data and they're looking at doing so many fun things. Um, did I just say fun with data? I did. Uh, but they're really looking at doing a lot of great stuff. So yeah, I'll connect you with them, definitely. Awesome, awesome. So I believe that those are, oh, oh, one second. Oh, no, you have one more question. Um, this is also from John Haney. And he said, are you all able to do all that is needed with data analytics within Tableau or do you also need something like Galvanize? Mm. Um, from a technology support perspective, um, and I don't have them with me, but I usually keep two screwdrivers on my desk. One's a Phillips head and one's a flathead. Um, and it may sound silly. Uh, so we do leverage different data platforms. And so the reason I say that um, is that sometimes you, you, know, you need the big long screwdriver. Uh, sometimes you just need that really short one that you never use, but it's in the toolbox for when it needs to come out. Um, so in regards to other data platforms, yes, we are leveraging other data systems. Um, Amber, I don't know if we're using that one today. Um, that's something you would have to answer for me. Yeah, no, I mean, we, we do uh, some work with Python, we use TapPy, but other than that. Okay, awesome, awesome. Well, we just wanna say thank you so much to Amber as well as Dan, both of you, this was great. Thank you so much for all, for sharing just some of those cool things that you are doing with Tableau. We are gonna um, share your email address um, if others want to reach out to them, other users want to reach out with them, reach out to them with questions. Um, is that okay if they reach out to you, Dan and Amber? Of course. Absolutely. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for presenting. It was awesome. And Del, if you want to kick us off to our next uh, set of presenters. Yeah, uh, echo Gina's statement. So uh, moving on to uh, Christy and Lily who are with CARE Oregon, and they'll be uh, sharing their member care and services dashboard and uh, a little bit about uh, what they're doing with Tableau Analytics. So uh, take it away, Christy and, uh, and Lily. Great. Thanks, Thanks everybody. I will share my screen here and then hand it over to Christy to kick us off. All right. To start, um, we're going to go through some brief slides to give you an intro about CARE Oregon, what the dashboard is, a population explorer dashboard, what we're trying to accomplish, the journey outcomes, and then Lily will do a demo. So first, a little bit about CARE Oregon. We're a healthcare company. We've been around for a little over 25 years. We provide healthcare management and other services to over 450,000 Oregonians. We do this through three coordinated care organizations, a Medicare Advantage Plan, Tribal Care Coordination Program, and a dental care organization. With that, we integrate physical, dental, mental health care, and substance use treatment. In addition to that, we also support programs that offer housing, fresh food, education, and more. The visual shows some of this. Um, Lily will show this in the demo, but within our three CCOs, we also contract with other dental health plans where we bring in, we need to segment that population and report on them separately. Next. 
So what are we trying to accomplish with this dashboard? We had two main goals. The first one is our management staff has various needs to explore our population by things like line of business, members' conditions, primary care providers, and other items um, to understand trends, diversity and equity, strategic objectives, and metrics. We also have care management staff that need easy, accurate, and timely access to learn about the members they are serving. So when we started this journey, the current state then was when we looked at our population view, we had really limited self-service capabilities to view the population by filters. It resulted in heavy reliance on our analysts to provide ad hoc results, whether in a new dashboard or just answering each question. For our member view, our care management staff, we were using disparate applications and dashboards where our staff had to piece together a member's care history, their calls, demographics, care co coordination, and conditions. So our future goal state was using Tableau, create a self-service dashboard, allowing the user to view populations by robust filtering, looking at membership counts by region, demographics, risk, cost utilization, and then we also needed the ability to drill into a member for a 360 view of their care and services. I'll hand it over to Lily to talk about the journey. Yeah, thanks, Christy. So uh, we knew that this dashboard would be a larger project. It's intended for enterprise use, um, and we were fortunate to already have some experience from folks who built some of those existing applications. Uh, to help inform our expectations, our use cases, requirements, um, and anticipated pain points. So we got a group together early on that met regularly, and we designed a proof of concept. Um, we have a lot of data sources um, incoming and outgoing, so we made a decision early on that we would source data only from our enterprise data warehouse, where we already had a good sustainable data model in place, and then we could focus data enhancements at that level of development alongside our data warehouse development team. So then we knew that the data we were using was trusted, it was standardized, it was familiar to uh, other analysts and the users. And then we were also aligned with the development roadmap for our enterprise data warehouse, which was really useful. And I think that was an important decision that down the road we were grateful that we made. Um, it also made it easier to develop Tableau ready data sources kind of on top of that layer for the dashboard to use. Um, we didn't anticipate as much um, kind of working with business logic. So um, particularly around business logic categor categorizing claims data. So I guess one lesson learned from that was not to assume that since we had done something like this before that things hadn't changed since then. So uh, we did end up doing some work and some rework around defining business logic. That's always the hardest part. Um, from there, we really just designed a prototype, iterated on it. We ran a pilot with a group of targeted users. We made in performance improvements, incorporated feedback from different groups. Uh, one thing that was really helpful during that stage of development and kind of the initial socialization of the dashboard was having buy-in from department leadership. So there was a lot of excitement around it, which was great. It was also really helpful to have Christy get involved and uh, help coordinate a rollout plan and involve the right people in those discussions. So then Christy and I showed the dashboard to our Voice of Customer Committee for approval and suggestions for rolling it out to the enterprise. And we ended up developing some really great training materials alongside the dashboard. Um, kind of had been doing a lot of demos up until then. So uh, now we have a kind of a full robust set of documentation that includes short training videos and guides for the users to access on their own. And since we've rolled out the dashboard, we've monitored the usage, we've continued to incorporate enhancements on an ongoing basis. And I think we've had really positive outcomes. Christy, you can probably speak a little more to the impact it's had on the analytics program at Care Oregon. Yeah, it's been really exciting and definitely a lot of lessons learned along the way that we are applying on all of our enterprise dashboards going forward. So some of those outcomes, we've increased, increased our staff satisfaction by providing that self-service one dashboard. We've improved, um, removed inefficiencies and provided standardization by doing that. We've reduced the ad hoc request to our analysts 
And overall, this is really exciting. We've increased our Tableau adoption of using any dashboards by 46%, largely because of this dashboard. We are positioned to provide external access to our clinics, which we're extremely excited about. And again, tons of lessons learned. It's been really fun. We have um, two last slides. Adoption, just to show you an idea of users. We've had 153 users to date use the dashboard starting in the pilot um, in June, and then in through December is what we've um, pulled in here. We had 71 distinct users using it in the month of December. And next slide, this is just to show you that it truly is an enterprise-wide used application, or I call it an application because it's so robust dashboard. It's used by our member-facing departments like behavioral health, health care management, population health, and then we have functional teams like finance and operations in here. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Lily to give you guys a demo and see what we're talking about. Okay, let me swap my screen here. Okay, so we can't show everything, kind of have a demo version of the dashboard because it has a lot of PHI. Um, but I'll try to give a good overview and highlight some of the Tableau features that are being used too. Um, so we start users off with a home page um, where they kind of have two different directions they can take, uh, which speaks to those two goals that Christy mentioned earlier. We have um, the member level view for kind of those care management staff and then the population aggregate level. Um, and there we go. Those are just um, buttons that direct to different dashboards. Uh, we also have a button that goes out to all of our documentation on an internal site, and then we're using a Vizin tool tip um, to give more information about how fresh the data is. So I'll just click into this side of the dashboard, and the buttons and tool tips are kind of a theme throughout um, as a way to improve the user experience, um, and it's just kind of fun. So the button goes to a general uh, page with a nice zip code map, and there's some other buttons um, and tool tips. You'll see that direct back to the home page, provide more dashboard information, uh, direct to other aggregate level dashboards in the workbook, uh, and then there's filter set. So uh, this is really important. It's just a show hide container with a variety of filters inside, which apply to all of the dashboards in the population view. Um, and we'll apply to that um, number at the top center of how many current members we're looking at. So this is nice. It allows a user to narrow down to their population of interest. Um, and you'll see that, um, let's just pick maybe our Medicaid primary folks, and that'll apply to that number. Um, filters are definitely a performance consideration we had to take into account and um, just trying to keep them as simple as possible and really target what people needed with each filter. So um, the map on this page is just a zip code map. Um, it's kind of cool. We can flip through the different regions of the state where we have members, um, we have members in various counties throughout the state of Oregon. So the users can toggle between those um, and the color gradient uh, by zip code as well can be changed using a parameter. So right now we're looking at unique members. There's a bunch of different measures that the user can choose. Um, some more tool tips to help give some instructions on how to use the dashboard and what types of features we have here. So for example, um, we have that same parameter here where we can select um, a different measurement and view them side by side for that region. So now we're looking at unique members and how much we've paid for their dental care um, to view side by side. It's kind of a fun feature to add to. And those are, I'm um, just kind of using sheet containers and parameter based filters. So I will go over to show the demographics dashboard. This is probably the most used dashboard in the population view. Um, this containing demographic breakouts, age, language, race, ethnicity, and sex. Um, you'll notice that the filter we applied before carries over here. And um, here we're breaking things out by 
each of these areas, but also comparing them between our CCO regions, um, so the metro and other regions of the state. We also have a new parameter option on this dashboard to um, allow the user to change what dimension is showing in those columns. So, for example, our CT is our regional care teams, which are um, just groupings that we uh, assign members for care coordination needs. Uh, and so then we can, you know, compare how things break out between those groups. Um, there's a lot of, of course, equity and diversity work going on at Care Oregon right now. So some of that work has also informed um, some updates to this dashboard on how we are displaying and describing demographic data. Um, for example, you can see how we've kind of adjusted what we're looking at language here. That's been um, to partner those initiatives too. Our buttons have moved up here, and I'll lastly show the assignments tab. So this view helps break out our membership by which different plans a member is enrolled with. We have a lot of complicated relationships with different Medicaid plans, so this helps kind of understand the different combinations and what where members fall into. Um, I'm going to update this filter for a better example here. We will look at... Hmm, all of our Medicaid people. And having all this variety of filters is, is nice. Like, for example, we can filter by um, the different plans a member is a part of, the, all those demographic features again. Um, uh, we have condition filters, including COVID-19, and then like how many visits a member has had in the past year. So it uh, becomes really easy to just ask a question like how many members have had COVID-19 in each of our plans. Um, so there's just a lot of uh, different options between the, the filters, between the um, columns, and between each of the dashboards to answer a lot of questions in one place. So for looking at assignments, maybe I'll show it by dental plan. So now here um, we can see for each of the dental plans that we have members enrolled with, what is their physical health payer mix? Uh, what plans are they enrolled with? We can even look at um, mental health plans or see you know, how many of the members assigned to each of these dental plans is also enrolled in Medicare. Um, and of course, hovering for more tooltip information. And we also have primary care providers to see where members uh, are assigned their primary care providers across these different dental plans. There's just a lot of um, different combinations that you can explore. Um, the other two dashboards are laid out basically the same as these other two. Um, this one just has things laid out by some risk information from the ACG. And then we have a utilization based one which shows how many uh, emergency room inpatient primary care visits that our membership has had in the past year. And then you may have noticed at the bottom bar throughout the dashboard, there's an option to sort of generate a member list. This was one of the compromises, of course, as people are um, using this tool, they want to generate a whole member table list out of, out of it, So, um, which is not really a great Tableau thing. So. Um, instead, we allow them to generate a list of the top 1,000 members based on um, who is most uh, the high, high, who is the highest cost, who's got the most prescriptions, and uh, various things there. Um, and that's that was kind of fun to build just using some index calculations and that kind of thing. Um, so a user can actually generate a member level list um, right from here, and from there they can click on a member from that list and drill down into their member view uh, kind of profile, or they can do that from the home page too. Um, so I can't live demo the member view. Um, there's so much inf member information on it, but we do have a kind of a redacted version of it that I can show. So if somebody like a care management staff looks up a member um, just so quickly, they can get a ton of information. Uh, the members demographic information, 
which uh, plans they're currently enrolled with, who their primary care provider is, how many visits they've had recently, um, different risk scores, authorizations, recent emergency room visits, care programs they're currently enrolled with, conditions they have. Um, and what is cool is they have this timeline that shows, um, you know, in the past 12 or 18 months when they've been enrolled in certain types of plans. So this example would be a gap in coverage um, sometime last year. And then alongside that, when in that period they've had different types of visits to the dentist or to the emergency room, uh, as well as when they filled prescriptions, when they've called us for something. And, and all of these are utilizing a lot of vis and tooltip kind of thing as well to give more information when a member hovers um, and some drill down actions too. So all of this information is also available to users in a tabular format, which people like. And there, this is great because there really isn't an application that we're using like our claim system or our uh, other software, but there isn't something that has all of this information in one place really, uh, just because we have so many different sources, vendors, plan partners, um, but it is all brought together in our enterprise data warehouse. So this is kind of like a window into there and allows people to get that one-stop shop for member information. Uh, that's pretty much it for the demo. I think we probably still have time for um, some Q&A. And thank you. Stephen, are you doing the Q and A? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in here. Uh, we have a question. Uh, how are you looking at change over time for members and member groups? Yeah, good question. Um, this dashboard is really just focused on our current membership. So that's a question we get all the time from um, our users on looking at change over time. So currently, this is really a snapshot of our, of our current state and answering those questions about um, what does our membership look like today? We do have several other dashboards like cost and utilization over time, um, our areas of focus. So those are just separate dashboards. And then we have also, uh, how many different data sources does your dashboard merge and how do you maintain the different data streams? Yeah, there are a lot um, of data sources. So like for the population view though, mostly it's um, just sourced off of a curated, one curated data source um, that kind of aggregates things up as much as possible to a member level so that we're not doing too much um, blending and you know, kind of doing most of that work uh, beforehand. But the member view does bring in um, a handful of different data sources at a detailed level um, and just filters those based on what member you have selected. So I hope that answers that question. I can I can go ahead and ask the additional questions that we have. Thank you for Robin and Del. My audio was acting up, but um uh, Timujin Baker um, just said no question, and he said, uh, he or she, they said, just to say, looks great, and they were very impressed with all of your data and dashboards, so that's, that's yeah, it was awesome. And then Melanie Severn Rue, sorry if I mispronounced it, um, is asking, how are you looking at change over time for members and member groups? I think we're trying and to think we're uh, answer that one. Yeah, just. Um, yeah, that was the first question. This, 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 that oh, sorry that. about that. Yeah. Okay. No worries. I think that's uh, all the questions then. Um, yes. Final comment that came in is especially impressed with the show hide filter container. So just wanted to call that out. Thank you for that. Um, Looks like we had one more 
question of leave, unless you got to Adele, some Michelle Ziedman did just ask, do you share any of your dashboards with the public? We do not. Um, it's quite an effort to share them with our external clinic partners. Um, it's all very member centric, uh, you know, personal protected health information. So uh, we don't have any public facing dashboards, um, at least not right now. It looks like there's one last question uh, from the chat. Um, Amr asks, uh, are uh, your users able to view on mobile? No, um, although that would be really cool. I don't think um, most of our users are, set, are trying to view things on mobile. Christy, I don't know if you can add anything to that as far as um, our goals for our Tableau dashboard environment. That would be cool. Though. Yeah, it really hasn't come up as a high priority as far as um, our focus right now is rolling out to our external partners, like Lily said, to our PCP clinics, and then expanding to our partners that work with our membership directly. So kind of that focus versus mobile hasn't come up. Fantastic. All right, um, for the sake of time, I know there was one more question that came in. Um, Lily and, and Christy, I don't know if you are open to uh, maybe taking the conversation online or excuse me, offline uh, for this final question. Uh, if so, I'm happy to connect everyone uh, to make sure that that, that does get answered, but um, did want to take it to, to Kevin and Amanda for um, the next presentation on uh, what's new in 2020.4. So. Sounds good. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Here we go. How's that coming through? Got I can it. See it. Yep. Fantastic. So, um, what we'd like to do now for the for the remainder of the conversation is to do sort of a year in review of the new Tableau features that were added. I know that a number of the comments uh, from uh, Dan uh, and um, uh, uh, the team at, at um, Care Oregon uh, related to really nice look and feel capabilities. And we wanted to be able to review uh, a lot of those sort of um, uh, cool capabilities that were added over the last year. I also know that a number of the different agencies that are Tableau uh, customers um, tend to have a bit of a uh, you know six month update window. So some of these new features that were added uh, six, nine months ago uh, might still be new to you. So we wanted to review this information. So um, uh, me and Amanda are going to tag team through this uh, list of cool new features. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, so just as a, uh, uh, a legal disclaimer, uh, occasionally in conversations like this, we talk about forward, uh, you know, forward looking uh, content stuff that might be on our roadmap and things like that. We always encourage our customers who are uh, looking to purchase Tableau based on feature functionality, do not purchase Tableau based on roadmap feature functionality, purchase it based on what is actually um, currently in the tool. And that's mostly what we're going to uh, look at today, though occasionally little things like for, uh, uh, roadmap stuff does creep into the conversation. So with that out of the way, uh, let's take a look. Um, we added a whole host of new capabilities in uh, Tableau since the beginning of 2020. Uh, and just to give you a sense, uh, a huge number of new features added over the course of this period um, and uh, stuff to come. Uh, but I want to focus on just sort of the greatest hits, the things that uh, we've seen to be incredibly impactful with our uh, state and local government customers um, and 
um, what uh, what those capabilities look like. So let's get started with uh, the what happened at the beginning of the year last year. Um, so uh, starting starting last year um, in 2020.1, we added dynamic parameters. Uh, dynamic parameters are the ability to automatically refresh and update parameter information uh, based on uh, data sources so that you're always your parameters that might be referencing a list of data is always the most current and uh, data available. Um, dynamic refreshes. Uh, we also allow the ability to schedule options on visualizations to refresh only after extract refresh is complete so that uh, the visualization is showing you the most current information based on the refresh, ex uh, the extract refresh timing. Really, really helpful. Um, the export button, I actually wanted to show this to you guys. So. Um, just like uh, a few versions ago, we added the ability to uh, add buttons to navigate where you're going inside of your workbooks. We've also added buttons uh, or added the ability for download buttons to be added as well. So if we look at this in, look at this in presentation mode. So uh, download image, download PDF, download PowerPoint, we can have one click um, buttons to download this stuff instead of forcing your, your, your customers to go through the process of sort of like the, the um, extract interface uh, button. So this is just right housed in the, um, in the dashboard itself. Uh, nice, easy uh, to manipulate interfaces for your customers to uh, download the content in the, mean, in the manner that makes sense to them. Um, So export buttons, external file store. Uh, so this is, this is particular to um, Tableau server customers on certain kinds of infrastructure, but many of our customers make use of like AWS as an infrastructure platform for hosting a Tableau server. So this is really valuable to a lot of our state and local customers. Um, and what this allows you to do is configure Tableau server's file store to place extracts and workbook revisions um, on sort of external disk uh, outside of the outside of the you know Tableau server black box. So this is really helpful and goes along the lines of um, uh, programs that we've done to do uh, like uh, external repositories and things like that for for ease of use and for um, managing. Like if you if you don't want to have Postgres be the um, sole source of uh, the, the data extract. If you'd want to use a different database for that repository, you have the choice of doing that with, with these sorts of tools. Um, set controls. Um, so set controls allow you to show uh, sets uh, as you would a filter and to select and deselect components of the set. So basically this allows you when uh, this allows you to give your end users the ability to add members or remove members from a set which uh, is sort of an extension of our ability to make dynamic sets uh, a, a reality. Um, so now you can have the dynamic ability to create the sets as part of the interaction in the dashboard. Very, very cool. Um, use map layers in web edit. So I wanted to show this to you guys as well. Uh, our, our web edit feature set has just exploded over the last year. And I wanted to give you guys um, uh, some of the uh, examples of this, this is going to be a fun thing that we're going to get to in a minute. Uh, but from uh, the map perspective, we can actually do all of the layer capabilities that we've always been able to do in desktop um, in, uh, in the browser, the web browser as well. And this is going to be something that we can continue to uh, iterate on as we, um, as we develop out the mapping capabilities of Tableau. Uh, so very, very cool. Nice to have a lot more of these uh, feature functionalities in the web browser. Um, so let's uh, pivot back to our review. And uh, for uh, the last big update for 2020.1, uh, which is such a fun thing. It's something that you might have noticed a little bit in our 
review here, but is the ability to have animations in your visualizations. Uh, so, uh, for example, um, in my dashboard here, let's select uh, some uh, date information here, March, April, May, and actually let's do uh, California here. And as we make selections, New York, our, our, anim our uh, we use animations to show the changes in those um, functionalities. So really cool, nice looking feel, really adds a layer of polish to those um, data visualizations. Uh, so that's 2020.1. Now I'm going to pivot over to uh, Amanda, who's going to review the updates that we've seen in 2020.2. Thanks, Kevin. Hi, everyone. So for 2020.2, the first feature we have here is we added dashboards to our lineage tool in Tableau catalog. So if anyone's not familiar with our lineage tool, it's a pretty powerful way to understand the relationships between all of the data assets on your deployment. And I think it, it used to go down to the sheet level, but with the 2020.2 release, it now goes to the dashboard level. And so what this allows you to do, um, see if Kevin can pull up an example here. If you do have a data asset and you wanna see what dashboards it feeds, like you see up on the screen here, for example, this Superstore World asset feeds 63 different dashboards. And if you were to click on the dashboards, you could see exactly what the dashboard name was, what workbooks it's comprised of, what project folder it's under and who owns it. So if you had an issue with your data asset, uh, you could you know, pretty easily check if it's impacting any production, you know, business critical dashboards. And if it is, you know who you could re reach out to to um, update them on that. So going back to the next one, so the next feature we have here is our Esri Arc GIS data connector. Um, and this was available in Tableau desktop. So what this allows you to do is you can now connect Tableau directly to your location data in Esri by simply entering an ArcGIS server URL or a geo service APR, API URL. Um, so like uh, Kevin's showing here, you just go to connect, you go down to a server, press the Esri ArcGIS server. So like here we have um, text.dot has all of their uh, road uh, GIS stuff uh, and they've got a GIS server that's open to the public. So we grab this little piece of information here. Yep. So once you have the URL, you can just go back to your connection, enter the URL, press connect. And then once that data updates, you'll be able to open up a new sheet. Give it a couple of minutes here. And so what this is doing, it's directly pulling data from the ArcGIS server. Um, so it allows for automated extract refreshes. So it ensures that your visualizations are always up to date. And you know it allows you to spend less time sourcing your data and more time analyzing it. And so as you see on Kevin's screen here, you're now able to see all of the construction um, road projects that are planned for Texas. All right, so going on to our next one. So the next feature we have is again in Tableau catalog and it's our high visibility of data quality warnings. So, you know, our data quality warnings are really made to let users know when a data asset is flagged. So, you know, maybe it's under maintenance, maybe it's stale, maybe an ETL um, job failed, maybe there's some other reason it needs to be flagged. But now with our high visibility, the, these data quality warnings show up right in your server in the top middle of your dashboard. So as you see in the blue there, when you pull up your dashboard, you would see that if you want to open data details, you easily could. 
and you could see any data quality warning that is listed for that dashboard. So for example, this one has three quality warnings. It looks like one table is under maintenance, one table is stale due to an ETL process failing, and one table is just being flagged to say it has sensitive data. So it's just an easier way to let, to let users know there are data quality warnings and to make sure they don't miss them. So our next feature is with Prep Builder, and we've added an option to do incremental refreshes. So now whether you're using Prep Builder or Conductor, you can now incrementally add fresh data to your flow. So Previously, you could only do full reset refreshes. So um, whenever you ran a flow, you would have to replace the full data set. All rows would be processed. Now you can do incremental where you're only processing new rows. So um, in the flow pane, if you wanna go back to this example. Yeah, so the first thing you have to do is you have to configure an incremental refresh. So if you clicked on the input file, which if you click on orders central there, Kevin, yep, under the settings, you would scroll all the way to the bottom, click the enable incremental refresh, and then it gives you some fields you have to choose. So you want to um, select the input field that will identify new rows. So I would select row ID here. You want to select the output file that you want to update, and you also want to select the output field that would identify new rows. So that would also be row ID in this case. And then once you do that, you can go back up to your flow pane. And now under the output, you see a little black arrow. If you click on that, you now see the option to pick either a full refresh or an incremental refresh. So this, you know, saves a lot of time and resources because it prevents the need to rerun the entire data set every single time. All right, moving on to the next one. So the next feature we have is a Tableau server feature. And we now allow you to publish workbooks right in server via the browser. So you no longer have to use Tableau desktop to publish workbooks. Um, so, you know, this is a much easier way to share your work across the organization um, and explore insights from others. And if you go to the server homepage, you see what Kevin is selecting there. All you need to do is new upload workbook. Um, and it's as simple as that. You would just choose the file and click upload. All right. The next feature we have here is with Tableau Desktop. And it's our relationship, um, AKA the noodle. So we've enhanced Tableau's data model with new capabilities to make it easier to analyze data across multiple tables and at different levels of detail. So I think Kevin, there's a workbook for this one as well. So previously when you combined data in Tableau, you had to create joins. Um, and you know, along with that, you had to determine what kind of join you wanted to do, inner or outer. Um, and you know, sometimes that can lose detail in your data and sometimes it can lead you to unintentionally filter your data. So the example you see up here on the screen, this is the old way in which um, you know, orders is joined with people table and returns table. If we go to the new way, Kevin, So now you see kind of a much simpler layout. You no longer have to do joins. All you have to do is drag the tables to connect. And all you have to do is determine what the relationship is. So if you click on one of the noodles, you see the only thing you have to do is determine that order ID in orders equals order ID in returns. And it's as simple as that. Um, and so really what this does is it postpones joins to the time and context of the analysis you're doing meaning Tableau will automatically join your data based on the state of your analysis. 
Um, and so this preserves the native, the native level of detail in your data and really only queries tables that are needed based on a field in a viz. One of the things that is also really helpful in terms of this um, for a, um, from a process standpoint, from a performance standpoint is Tableau is also maintaining the integrity of each of the different data tables. So my order table here is just the columns and rows from my order table and my returns table is just the columns and rows from my return. So to Amanda's point about only making the join at the point of, uh, uh, of connectivity or the point of sort of pulling out the resource, uh, it, it's also sort of keeping the data the weight of the data relationship really light uh, until the moment and only at the moment that it's needed. So really, really cool stuff here. Yeah, great point. Thanks, Kevin. Um, if you do, uh, if you do want, uh, if you do want to be able to build relationships uh, such as uh, joins and unions the way that you always have been, uh, and you don't want to create these, these sort of noodle relationships, you can simply double click on the um, on the desired field, and you can pull things out and create um, the uh, the normal join relationships the way you always have. Um, the other thing is Tableau isn't going in and turning all of your historic relationships into or, uh, joins and, and unions into these relationship objects. Um, anything that is a historic workbook or content uh, uh, will keep its current structure and design. It's not being turned into something new. And last but not least, um, the final feature we have here is we have a new Salesforce connector in Prep Builder. So, you know, this is really just allowing you to connect Salesforce directly with uh, Prep Builder to start getting to analysis faster. And with that, I'll turn it back to Kevin. Thank so you. 2020.3. Uh, so 2020.3 was another big release cycle. Um, and uh, we uh, were sort of continuing on the full core press that we had with 2020.2 and all of the nice features in all of the different uh, tool set areas um, uh, that we have. So uh, in data quality warnings, again, uh, indicators in Tableau Desktop showing data quality warnings from Tableau Management. So when you go to your, when you're in Tableau Desktop and you go to select a, a an object on your Tableau server that might have a data quality warning, you see that in the connection, um, in the connection view. Um, so that's, that's really helpful to continue that sort of downstream process of if there's something that your folks that are developing content should be concerned about, they can see it when they go to connect to that data source. Um, grant licensing on sign-in. Uh, I actually did this for my Tableau prep here today before I, uh, before I jumped into um, our presentation here. Uh, automatically grant uh, uh, automatic uh, granting of site role creator explorer viewer upon initial sign in to a Tableau site based on Active Directory group. So this is doing some, um, uh, this is using some of the intelligence that you're sort of pumping into uh, your Active Directory to automatically assign capabilities based on uh, users. So you don't have to do a lot of that sort of post work uh, once you've synced with your Active Directory server. This is well, another one of those areas that's just lifting more burden up off of the uh, uh, server admin folks. Um, so uh, I, uh, I can have more happy conversations with folks like Amr. <laughs> um, so group, uh, group steps. Um, this is a cool new feature and it has to do with uh, a big quality of life ask from a lot of our users who are doing development in Tableau prep. Uh, group and collapse multiple steps into a single group that acts like a single step to run, uh, copy, or move uh, large flow, like elements of larger flow. So let me show you what this looks like. Um, if we go back into our example here, uh, this whole sort of object here is a pretty complex thing, and I want it to be a little, e like, take up a little bit less space in my, uh, in my uh, flow. So I'm going to come down here to group, and it creates this nice little folder. Um, and if I want to expand it, I can see the information here or collapse it. So it tells me 
uh, A, it shows the things that are contained within the group. I can name this group something, you know, whatever I want to. Um, so if I come down here and uh, rename, I can call this uh, and have all of that information contained within this object so that I can sort of compartmentalize and parcel out uh, the exact different steps that I'm doing to get my data ready. So cool, cool, cool stuff in here. Um, improvements in data source and viz filters. So no more slow loading and interaction times uh, when creating filters. Uh, so this is um, much more dynamic and, 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 and nuanced cancel commands um, so that it doesn't take forever when you decide that you want to cancel something or what, what is what is going on inside of the, the filter. So we're just optimizing how we're referencing that data, making it a lot uh, easier for you guys to um, uh, to work more smoothly as you're uh, manipulating the data and managing um, that, that information. Um, the in operator, this is a new operator in our um, in our desktop and server uh, functionality for calculations. So I actually built this out to, to show you exactly what this looks like. Um, let's go to this and here we go. So I, I've, I've created a filter here uh, where, um, uh, where uh, the state value is uh, California, Oregon, Washington, uh, Alaska, or Hawaii, then this is in the Pacific group. So I'm gonna go ahead and run this. And this is gonna create a filter that allows me to uh, just look at um, uh, the states in, uh, in, 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 the, in the Pacific. Um, so let's put those on color. And I can see that these have been, these have been pulled out. Uh, I probably uh, misstated the uh, state here. This should be WA instead of WS. Um, and what this is doing is this allows for uh, a much more, um, there we go. And there we go. Uh, uh, so this allows for much more nuance in sort of group color creation uh, by based on calculations and um, a really nice, uh, new uh, capability for um, uh, for our case and and uh, if then logic statements. Cool, cool, cool. So jumping back in, um, uh, inequality relationships. Uh, so up until uh, up until twenty twenty five three, uh, the relationship tool was really valuable, but you could only do equal relationships. So this allows me to do slightly different kinds of analysis with my relationships uh, rather than just an equivalent relationship. So if we go back to our relationship example here um, and I go to my data source, uh, I can actually adjust this, um, uh, the, the kind of relationship that I want to create here to be uh, all of the same different kinds of uh, equality relationships that I might make for a join. So uh, this is going to add, or this adds a lot of nuanced uh, complexity to the kinds of relationships that we can create. And uh, last but not least, certainly not least, is write to database for prep builder. Um, so now not only can you output content to your Tableau server, not only can you output uh, content to Excel files or to uh, CSV files or to your rather to CSV files on Excel files. Uh, uh, you, you can also push content from Tableau Prep Builder uh, through Conductor into a uh, database. Uh, so, um, like we say here, uh, Microsoft SQL Server, Postgres, MySQL, Teradata, Snowflake, Amazon Redshift, all of these different databases uh, can now consume changes that you're doing or transformations that you're doing in Tableau Prep into, um, into your server. So uh, for example here, 
Now I can set a database table location. I can also determine, do I want to um, create a net new table? Do I want to overwrite an existing table? Uh, who has permissions to do that sort of stuff? All sorts of things like that. So um, we wanted to give you guys the governance that you needed in order to make sure that this sort of process was safe and effective, while at the same time giving you the ability to leverage all of this hygiene, uh, this data hygiene that you can do in Tableau Prep uh, by pushing it back into your data warehouse, your data store, your database. Cool. So that's the, uh, those are the high level improvements with 2020.3. Um, and I understand that Amanda's got some uh, uh, stuff that doesn't even appear on my uh, highlights here for 2020.4. Uh, so we're gonna, we're gonna jump into that and, and uh, take a look at the big, the big improvements that we had at the end of last year. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. And I know um, we only have a minute or two left, so I'll try to go through these quickly. But the uh, the first feature that we have here is resource monitoring monitoring tool on Linux. So um, you know our resource monitoring tool allows server admins to monitor you know each of their Tableau server environments. So looking at things like CPU spikes, you know higher number of users than usual, etc. Um, it was previously only available on Windows, and now it's available on Linux. Um, so the next one, Kevin. Um, so similar to our kind of more traditional web editing, we now allow prep web editing, web editing. So right in server, you can now create flows, you can edit flows. Um, so this has been a pretty highly requested feature. Uh, since it saves our users time, you know, it helps your organization scale consistently. Um, so as Kevin will show here, right in server, you can create a new flow, you can edit existing flows, pretty much everything that you can do in Prep Builder, you can now do right on your server. And the last feature that I'll talk about that is not on um, Kevin's dashboard, but I wanted to mention it before I end here, is we have some spatial analytic enhancements. So we now have marked layers for maps. And what that allows you to do is it allows you to add additional layers of marks to the same map visualization. So traditionally, our maps have only supported one layer but now you can create as many layers as you want, provided they come from a single data source. So um, I don't know if we have a, an example here, but um, an example I'll give is if you have, you know, you wanna map hurricane wind zones on a map, um, you know, you could you can map that out by zone, by by color, based on the intensity of how how high winds get, and then on top of that, you could top you could start plotting locations of things like hospitals or um, hurricane shelters or where first responders are. So if you're a city planner or um, you know in emergency services, you can get an idea of different points, how they relate on a map, and how they relate to different zones that you map. So with that, I, I know we have to wrap up soon. So I will end it there and I think turn it over to uh, either Gina or Dell. Thank you so much, you all. Great job, great pieces of information. I think Dell is gonna do the closing remarks. We do have a couple of questions, but just in the interest of time, um, we might just kind of answer those offline, um, but thank you so much for presenting. And um, I'm gonna hand it over to Dell. Sure, uh, thanks Gina. Um, I mean, mine aren't gonna really take long, but just wanna take a few moments here to, to thank everyone that, that did join um, and present as well. Thank you so much, um, Dan, Amr, Christy, Lily. Uh, Amanda and Kevin um, for, for presenting all the information here. We will share a recording once it is made available. We will also share the deck as well. That was shared at the beginning of the presentation with our contact information. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to the account team. Feel free, feel free to you know, blast all of us if you're not sure who to contact and allow us to figure out who's gonna answer, uh, answer the question. Um, Craig, I actually, I know you had pinged me. You wanted to make a, a final remark yeah. as well, so feel free to chime in. Yeah. So, in addition, just last thing. So, I know we we do these kind of regionally based events. This is a uh, the Pacific Northwest User Group event. Um, coming out of Tableau Conference last year, I wanted to to kind of bring everybody's attention. We do have three 
kind of industry communities that have spawned out of um, our public sector teams. So there's a transportation community group that actually uh, Portland Bureau of Transportation uh, presented at uh, on our last session. Um, there's a health and human services community group and there is a public safety community group. So those three groups all uh, meet again separately with a, a, uh, a public sector focus and just a little bit more attention to those um, those specific uh, kind of business cases and and just try to connect folks again in a, in a little tighter community group. So those three groups are also available to participate in, to join those presentations, or if you'd like to present, we're always looking for customers to, um, to help be part of those. The other thing I'll mention is there will be a government, a Tableau government summit, which will be a national event that we're hosting on March 23rd. So there'll be an invitation and an agenda coming out for that soon. So that's another, um, another event that's government focused that uh, we'd like to, to encourage everybody to participate in uh, if you're available. So we'll include all of that in our follow-up and uh, look forward to, uh, again, and, and, and even for this session, if you, you're on the call and you think, boy, it'd be fun to participate in this and show what we're doing, please let us know because we would, we would, uh, we would like to encourage more folks to, uh, to join in. Dell, I think that's it for me. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, we are right at 1130. So again, uh, thank you to everyone that joined and presented. And uh, we'll follow up shortly with uh, all the information that we promised. Have a good day, everyone. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.